first. All right, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, my name is Jessica. I usually go by Jess, just I, there's no preference though. So no worries on, on which you prefer. Um, my job here at the Dorothy Mulder Museum is executive director. I've been working here for um, eight years now. And I'm the only year round employee at the Dorothy Moulter Museum. And so um, the job that I do is pretty varied. And one of the fun things is having the opportunity to do programs like this. So I appreciate your presence and attention and interest in this. And my style of presentation is pretty informal. So if there are questions that come up, Kelsey, um, feel free to, you know, Hey, say, hey, I have a question um, and we'll go from there. Um, and I hope there are questions because sometimes those questions lead to tangents that lead to stories that I hadn't planned on telling and can be really interesting. So um, with that being said, I'm gonna jump in. So the Dorothy Moulter Museum is our operating name. Um, we're formally registered as the Dorothy Moulter Memorial Foundation. And our mission is to preserve and interpret Northwoods wilderness heritage through learning opportunities inspired by Dorothy Moulter. She was the last non-Indigenous resident of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. So everything we do, uh, all the education or programming we do is through the lens of Dorothy's life. And we find great inspiration in um, the story that her life tells us. So. Who was Dorothy Moulter? And if you don't know, why should you care? Um, so of course I'm very biased. It's my job to care and to know about who Dorothy was. Um, but Dorothy was an unlikely prospect for the notoriety that she ultimately gained throughout her life living in the Boundary Waters. And she lived up there uh, for most of 56 years, even after the 1964 Wilderness Act, and she passed there in December of 1986. And so what I'm going to do tonight is go through her life story, uh, because, you know, she did was known as the Rip Your Lady. Um, she was also a nurse, but her life is just as nuanced and complex as all of our lives. And so sometimes it's helpful to understand somebody when you know a little bit more about um, where they came from. And Dorothy, and this is one of the cutest pictures that we have in our collection of Dorothy, uh, was born on May 6, 1907 in Arnold, Pennsylvania, which was uh, near an industrial part of Pennsylvania. Her father worked for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And uh, she was one of six children. Now, when she was just seven years old, um, they experienced some family tragedy and her mother passed away. But before then, all of the Moulter children um, lived together. Uh, there were brothers and sisters of both her mother, Maddie Moulter, and her father, Cap was his nickname, John Moulter. Um, and they would visit relatives here and there. And so when her mother died, uh, Cap had to figure out what was he going to do with all of these children. So they started out being kind of sent out to different aunts and uncles, two by two. And after a while, the children were very homesick, um, understandably. They really wanted to be together. And so Dorothy's father decided that he was going to gather them up and he was going to move westward. And because he worked for the railroad company, he tried um, settling in different areas along the railroad system moving west. And so in Cincinnati, um, he settled for a little while there and put the children in an orphanage. And during the, the teens in the 1900s, it wasn't uncommon. Um, some of you might have heard of or be familiar with the orphan trains, um, especially after World War I. A lot of children that were left orphans were shipped out west to be adopted. Unfortunately, a lot of them as farmhands, <laughs> more so than actual family members. Um, but Cap, rather than formally giving up his children, he placed them at an orphanage there for safekeeping. 
So the children could all be together. They had a roof over their head. Vision, hopefully most of the time, um, other children to play with. And then eventually on one of his railroad uh, routes up in Michigan, he met Myrtle and he remarried Myrtle in 1919. And so Cap and Myrtle went down to the orphanage, gathered the children up and then went further west and settled permanently in Chicago on the south end of town. So Dorothy went to school at Calumet High School um, and was a very active young woman. Uh, she enjoyed sports, she enjoyed outdoor activities, and of course from about 1919 to the, the mid to late 1920s there weren't a lot of opportunities for young women to participate in organized sporting activities. However, there were intramural activities that Dorothy could be a part of. So she took advantage of swimming, volleyball, basketball, and the shooting sports team, and actually took the citywide girls championship in 1924 for sharpshooting. And this is a, a copy of her target from one of those competitions. And it's interesting when I look back on some of these archives and see, you know, her, her ability with a firearm, um, it's interesting to look, think ahead to her life and how this skill that she had possessed at a young age came in very handy when she finally moved up to the wilderness of Northeastern Minnesota. Now, after school, Dorothy didn't take the path of the majority of her peers at the time. So in 1927, she graduated high school. Um, that in and of itself was a big step forward for young women of her time, especially knowing that she had this opportunity in Chicago where perhaps if she was in an area of Pennsylvania where she was born, she might have not have had the opportunity to graduate high school. Uh, but at this time, um, you may be familiar or aware that women had a few choices after high school graduation or after they were finished with schooling. You know, marriage, uh, being a teacher, being a secretary of some kind, or going to nursing school. Um, and those were kind of the more socially accepted um, careers for uh, a middle class young lady. And so Dorothy chose to go to nursing school and she enrolled at Auburn Park Teaching Hospital. Now, this teaching hospital no longer exists. In fact, the street that it was built on no longer exists. Um, we did some research, uh, not this past winter, but the winter before for a program on her nursing background and could find no current record um, or available record online uh, regarding that particular hospital. And all the current maps, if you look online, don't even show the street that that, that hospital was in. So Dorothy was enrolled in this, in this teaching hospital um, in a nursing degree. She had a focus on infectious diseases. Um, and it was during a summer break that her father, her stepmother, an uncle, and a family friend were planning a trip to go fishing in the North Country. Now, her father, Cap, had been up to this part of the state, um, out of the Ely area, many times. The train came up here um, to Winton and then to Ely. And he had been mostly going up to Basswood Lake. And Basswood was really good fishing, very um, diverse topography, large lake. But when he was up one time, he had heard rumor of a new resort that had opened up a few years before on this beautiful, clear, deep lake where you could catch a lake trout. And Cap was intrigued. Um, Basswood has a, a little bit of a, a darker color water to it and he wanted to try something new. So they planned this trip to go up to Knife Lake and stay at the Isle of Pines Fishing Resort. At the last minute, one of the people in the party had to back out and Dorothy being on break from nursing school invited to go with. And so she jumped at the chance and, <clears throat> excuse me, and came up here to Ely. So at that time, they took the train 
once they got um, near Ely, then they would um, rent a car um, or have somebody drive them um, up to Moose Lake Landing. Um, I sometimes like to stop and ask if anybody has been up to Moose Lake Landing before. It's kind of, it's, it's challenging on Zoom, but. You can put it into the chat if you have. Gives me a minute to take a sip of water too. It looks like no one. Oh, well, there is something to put on your list of things to do this summer if you wanna get out and about or you've got somebody that, that wants to get out and about with you. So I'm sitting in the basement of the Dorothy Moulter Museum, which is located on the east end of Ely where the last property um, on, on city property here in Ely proper. So from where I am right now, if you were to drive out to Moose Lake Landing, it's approximately 20 miles, excuse me. And depending on the road conditions, depending on the traffic, what time of the year it is, um, if it's night or day, it could take you a half an hour to 45 to an, up to 60 minutes to get out to Moose Lake Landing. Uh, it's a public a boat landing. Pardon? There's a question in the chat. Is that uh, near La Torrell's Resort? La Torrell? Yes, right next door. Yeah, so Laterals um, Resort and Outfitting is, um, if you think of like Laterals is here, further to the east is the public boat landing, and then the next little, um, like right there is the canoe landing, and then the end of that road is the Northern Tier High Adventure Boy Scout Base, formerly Somers um, Canoe Base. So that's the, the jumping off point for anybody that would want to go up to the Isle of Pines Fishing Resort um, where Dorothy ended up living. So, you know, imagine it's 1930, you're a young woman um, riding with several other people in a, um, you know, if you think um, Model T Ford vehicle of the time, I'm not good with cars, but I think that gives you a good image in your head. And this Fernberg Road, which is very similar in character to the Gunflint Trail, um, was built at the same time that the Gunflint Trail was put in. So a relatively new road going into the forest, um, likely at this time, probably still a, a gravel two-track road, so with pullouts so that you can pass another vehicle. Um, it definitely didn't just take 40 minutes for them to get from Ely up to Moose Lake Landing. From there, they would jump in some aluminum canoes and the route that is shown in a white dotted line up through the Moose Chain of Lakes and through um, the first portage, which um, is referred to locally as Indian Portage, but it's the Birch Lake Portage. So it's the first one shown in yellow with the arrow. And then an additional five portages after that to get into Knife Lake, which is where the Isle of Pines Fishing Resort is. Now, if you were to do that today, um, this distance is approximately 13 to 15 miles, depending on, you know, how straight you can paddle your canoe. Um, and if you have to go around any obstacles or portages or you know, have issues. And it could easily take you a full day of paddling just to get up to Knife Lake. So Dorothy's family um, as guests to this resort chose to take canoes and paddle their way up. However, in 1930, the other option would also be to take a float plane. Float planes, um, very much like water taxis, you know, flying you in and flying you out. However, a bit more expensive for a family vacation. Um, plus, I, knowing Cap's personality based on um, writings that we have, he seemed like the more adventurous type and probably was more interested in taking the canoe route to get up there. So Dorothy, and her family got up to the Isle of Pines. Um, the Isle of Pines is a cluster of three islands. Um, if you're not familiar with Knife Lake, and this satellite image um, is a little misleading. It makes it look like there's um, some islands or shallow areas where that Robbins Island is listed. Um, that's not accurate, <laughs> but um, 
the Isle of Pines circled in green there consists of, of one large island and then two small satellite islands that sit just to the north of it. And they were connected by wooden footbridges. So it looks like they're all kind of connected by a little tiny piece of land. Those are footbridges. Um, and the total area for this grouping of islands is estimated at about 13 acres. So the original owner, Bill Berglund, um, purchased these islands from a timber company that he had worked for as a lumberjack. And they had left um, a considerable amount of equipment there. So he was able to fell the trees, mill them down, and build the log cabins, um, three of which we have here at our museum in Ely. Now, when Dorothy got there, um, they were checking in to their cabin. So there were several guest cabins on the island. Uh, the winter cabin, the trapper cabin, and the point cabin were the more prominent cabins. We heard rumor there was another cabin that existed. However, we've never seen any documentation or photography of it, so we, we can't confirm or not. Um, but Dorothy was in one of those guest cabins, which are all very similar. Front porch area, a big communal area, and then two bedrooms um, off the backside. When she got into their cabin to settle in and put their luggage in, a chipmunk startled her, popping out. And so she went out to let Bill know that there is this rodent of some kind in her cabin. And he, um, of course, chuckled and said, oh, you think that's interesting? Check this out. And he took a biscuit and put it on his hand and held it up. And a gray jay came and sat on his hand and ate the biscuit from his hand. And of course, Dorothy was just taken aback by the the forwardness of these wildlife species, um, let alone seeing them in the first place. And so she took a walk around the island and she heard this strange chattering and looked over and she saw what she later found out was a kingfisher flying and diving to catch a minnow. And she heard some scurrying along the shoreline and she looked down and she saw a mink swimming and jumping along the shoreline. She heard the slap of a beaver tail as she startled it when she came around the corner to a marshy part of the, the islands. And that evening she heard the calls of the common loon. Now some of these animals she knew existed and knew what they were but had never seen them um, in real life. And so when I think about Dorothy and her going up to this place, I, I imagine that she must have had some kind of epiphany must a profound moment um, on this first day there because ultimately she chose to spend the rest of her life there. Um, now she also caught really massive lake trout um, during these trips. This is a 28 and a half pound lake trout um, that she caught. And I can't, I've never caught something that big. I can't imagine uh, what it must have taken to <laughs> reel that in, especially with the fishing gear of the time, which often was a giant reel for lake trout that the reel itself weighed eight pounds. So definitely this amazing first experience up on the Isle of Pines that changed the trajectory of her life. Now, after this visit, she went back down to Chicago, finished nursing school, and passed her board exams the following summer. But from the 1930s all the way through the early 1940s, um, her family would continue to go back up and stay at this resort, and then she would stay for longer and longer periods of time after their vacation and, and work seasonally for Bill Berglund. So this image um, is Bill. Bill was 33 years old, Dorothy Sr., and his dog, Nebs, which was a shepherd mix. Um, Bill being much older um, and a... Uh, much more harder on his body, shall we say. And Bill was um, enjoyed smoking and drinking and gambling um, and worked very hard in very physical labor for much of his life. 
And so in the mid 40s, um, he started to feel the effects of his age, uh, some of his life choices, as well as just health ailments that he was dealing with. Um, and so we believe it was about the mid to late 1940s, um, he proposed a business arrangement to Dorothy that if she were to stay on the islands year round and be not just a manager of the property and assist him with the resort business, but also as his nurse, he would deed the property to her after he passed away. And so that is how Dorothy became the owner proprietor of the Isle of Pines Fishing Resort. Um, in 1948, Bill's health, um, between 47 and early 48, his health was really kind of up and down. And then Bill passed away in March of 1948. Um, and although he forgot to create a formal directive or will for what he wanted to happen to the property, um, his relatives knew very well what his intentions were. They knew Dorothy and how um, she had um, worked for him and provided him the nursing care that that their arrangement called for. So she went down to Silver Bay to the family and they transferred the deed of ownership to her. So when she was in her early forties, she became the sole owner proprietor of this fishing resort as a young educated unmarried woman. And so you can imagine that, that um, at that time in our US history, that, that um, kind of was a new thing that wasn't expected of women of the time. And so she got um, much more popular as a resort owner after this. Now about this same time, and I'm not gonna go too far into the weeds on this part of the history, um, because I can go way far into detail about um, the history of the, the Wilderness Act of 1964. But um, 1948 was about the time when the Forest Service started going out and actively purchasing private land holdings. And that was laying the groundwork for the 1964 Wilderness Act. And in some of the records that we have at the museum, um, we have some internal memos between Forest Service um, local office and Washington DC that um, knew that Bill Berglund had been ill. And as they began the process of, of trying to get people to sell their land to the government, um, this internal memo basically uh, was like, well, Bill Berglund is in the hospital in Virginia, so it doesn't sound like he's doing too well. Let's wait and see, <laughs> thinking maybe he'll die and we could just have the property um, without knowing the arrangement that he had made with Dorothy Mulder. And so, of course, as soon as Dorothy took over, she started receiving requests for the sale of her property, which she promptly um, put in the wood stove and forgot about. Now, once word got out that Dorothy Moulter was this um, educated young lady that was operating a wilderness fishing resort 15 miles from the nearest road, uh, people were really curious. They wanted to know what was this woman doing there. And so she had uh, writers from Time Magazine, Life Magazine, um, the Saturday Evening Post flying out so that they could do an interview with her. And one of the most influential articles that came out of this was titled The Loneliest Woman in America in the 1952 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. And of course, Dorothy wasn't lonely. She was operating a fishing resort and had guests coming um, from when ice went out in the spring till ice came up in the in the fall, she had people there. And of course, when snowmobiles were invented and people got their hands on their snowmobiles in the late 1950s, she had visitors year round. Um, but as um, was not uncommon during this time to embellish and sensationalize a story for increased readership and to, to get attention, um, the loneliest woman in America sounds way more interesting. So if you can imagine back then in 52, 
um, the impact that this article had on Dorothy was similar to somebody going viral on the internet today. Uh, people read about this woman, they wanted to, to meet her, to know what was going on. And so visitation to the Isle of Pines started to increase. This only continued to increase when the flight ban that was issued in 1949 took full effect in 1952. So this picture previously, this was October 14th, 1952. Now in 1949, President Truman issued an executive order banning all flights below 4,000 feet in what was then referred to as the roadless area, which is now what is the boundary waters, because a group of um, conservationists were concerned about the fisheries population in those remote lake areas and those fisheries being um, having too much pressure put on them by fly-in fishermen that had no regulations. They could go in as much as they want, stay as long as they want. And there is very little enforcement, if any, um, of any kind of fishing regulations that existed. And so the conservationists were concerned that there was no control over how many fish were being taken out of these lakes and at what age. So were they breeding population fish or were they young fish? And their concerns went from the state legislature all the way to um, the Oval Office. And they were able to convince the president that, yeah, maybe if we limit float planes, we can reduce some of that pressure on the fisheries. Well, as you can see, <laughs> this plane still went into the Boundary Waters in fall of 52. There were two pilots. Ernie Hautala was one of them. Um, the other pilot, they continued flying in to supply the different resorts that existed similar to Dorothy. So if you're not familiar, prior to the Wilderness Act, there were tons of fishing resorts in and one of the main ways they were able to get their supplies um, and sometimes their guests was by float plane. So these two pilots uh, decided that the federal government was not going to tell them what to do and they continued to do fly-ins. Um, and this was one of the last flights until one of the pilots was caught and his plane was confiscated. And the other pilot decided they were also going to stop and not risk losing their plane. So this shifted what Dorothy could and could not do in terms of bringing in supplies and necessities for her fishing resort. So she went down her list and kind of pulled out the, the unnecessary items um, and then made sure that she would just, you know, get what she needed or have other friends and family bring in things as they could. Pop or soda pop in glass bottles in wooden crates certainly was not a necessity. And Dorothy certainly was not going to ask anybody else to carry them in over six portages. Excuse me. And so she just cut that off her list. However, she got the idea, and we're not sure where, but she got the idea that she could repurpose those glass bottles and start making her own beverage. She had hundreds, if not over a thousand glass bottles in wooden crates stacked up, stored on the island. Because when you're on an island in the middle of the lake, you don't have trash removal. You have nowhere to put things that you don't need anymore. And so she pulled all those bottles out, cleaned them up, and found a really easy, basic root beer recipe. Now, I won't go um, too far into the history of root beer. I did a program on that earlier this winter for a, an event we had, but root beer is a North American beverage, an American beverage, so North South America. Um, it originated here. It is um, very culturally significant to a lot of indigenous peoples um, as a tea, but also then translated very easily into a fermented beverage. And root beer recipes 
basically were a dime a dozen. You could find any kind of root beer recipe you wanted. And Dorothy did not have the time nor the energy to go around and find sassafras or sarsaparilla plant plants and start crushing roots and making root beer from, you know, all natural sources. She was a practical lady. And so she went with sugar, yeast, and root beer flavoring. Now, when the a w was here in Ely, it was open until the early 90s. She could buy root beer syrup from the a w So that kind of was the combination of sugar and root beer flavoring, but she wasn't picky. As long as she had the basic ingredients needed, she started to make root beer. What? She would pull water from the lake, boil it up, mix the ingredients together, put them in the bottles, and she purchased two bottle cappers and then would get bottle caps from the A&W restaurant as well and just bottled her own root beer. And she would take the crates and put it in the ice shed so that they would get cold. And then as she needed, she would pull out a crate at a time and have it available for her guests that were staying at the resort. Now, this was a big job, especially later as time went on and she gained more notoriety. Um, so she had to recruit family members to do this. But if you think about, she was getting a lot of attention from being the single businesswoman in the middle of nowhere. And now she's making root beer and selling it cold because she harvested ice in the wintertime for her ice house. Her popularity snowballed. So she would start having her nieces and nephews and the children of close friends coming out or people that she knew that were staying for the day, just visiting if they had kids, she would recruit anybody and everybody to help her make this root beer. It was a, a group effort. You know, many hands make light work in these kinds of situations. So once again, they get that crate of soda bottles, it would stick them out in the ice shed. And I guess my slide for the ice shed is, is gone, but um, every winter, Dorothy would host um, ice cutting parties. Now, in the beginning, it was just Dorothy and Bill Berglund and a few other helpers. But once it was just Dorothy, people in the community in Ely and friends of hers kind of became very protective of Dorothy. And they wanted to make sure that she was successful. And they had a lot of fun going up and visiting her too. And so they would plan these ice cutting parties and eventually it became part of the local snowmobile club outings every winter and they would cut these giant blocks of ice usually about 32 to 36 inches square and stack them in the ice shed and if they were packed properly which Dorothy was the one that packed them using sawdust and moss she could have ice all the way through to the end of September into October. Now you can imagine if you um, are having a lot of young people, especially teenagers helping you make your root beer or coming up to visit. Uh, remember Dorothy had five brothers and sisters and most of them married and had their own children. So she had this, this plethora of family members in the form of nieces and nephews that wanted to go visit Dorothy. Um, they would refer to her as Aunt Dot, according to two of her great nephews who uh, occasionally stopped by the museum. And each family would get at least two weeks every summer and they would rotate so that each family's children had an opportunity to go up and visit and stay with Dorothy. And I think about my, when I was 12 or 13 and I would go visit my grandma, you know, there was always, there, there was fun. There was a lot of fun with grandma, but there were always things that had to get done. You know, we had to finish the dishes after dinner or in the morning we had to make our bed, even if it was summer vacation. And with Dorothy, it's the same way, except she's on a wilderness island. 
So not only do you have the normal chores, but you're also helping clean fish for the resort guests that are staying and putting gas in the boats so that people can go fishing and making sure that everybody has water available in their cabin and doing the laundry. So the story goes that Dorothy uh, got into saying, quit your belly aching quite a bit. And her brother, Bud, who had a bit of a sense of humor, decided to paint a sign that said, quit your belly aching, but not spelled how you would expect it to be spelled, spelled more phonetically, and hung it right outside the root beer tent. Uh, and the joke is that Dorothy said it so much that people needed a sign to be reminded of it when she wasn't around. So the sign, which we do have in our collection, um, is probably one of the most recognizable parts of Dorothy's um, summer tent island, aside from the root beer itself. Um, and the museum has actually trademarked it. And you'll find it on quite a, a few items in our gift shop. Um, so if you're ever looking for a good old fashioned Minnesota passive aggressive t-shirt to wear, um, stop by the museum because we've got them for you here. <laughs> now, Dorothy also had a few other items um, that are highlighted in our uh, museum collection here. And I always like to include my favorite item. Oh, there's, there's the ice house, a little out of order. And there's Dorothy pulling ice. This one. This is probably my favorite item that we have in our collection. And it's, it's just really cool to be able to see it in person. Um, I don't know if anybody had one of the early snowmobile models, uh, but this is Dorothy's 1957 Polaris Snow Traveler. Um, now this particular sled uh, was used probably more often by her father. This is her dad cap right here. Um, but they both use them to go in and out. So from the islands to Moose Lake and then hitching a ride into town. Um, very practical and very effective most of the time. But if you can see in this picture um, of the, the main picture with Cap, the motor on this snowmobile is on the back of the snowmobile. And there is a wheel, and that wheel is actually a crank that if the snow isn't packed or there's a lot of slush on the lake, this thing is really heavy. And if you don't go fast enough, you easily get bogged down. That crank allows you to lift the engine, which the track is attached to, up and out of the slush, chip off all of the ice and slush and then lower it back down once underneath has frozen a little bit so that you can keep moving forward. So these definitely made Dorothy's life easier, uh, but depending on the situation, sometimes they made it harder for a brief period of time. Now, when the snowmobiles became readily available um, to the general public, like I mentioned before, snowmobile clubs made big events out of going up to Dorothy's. And the different clubs um, from Grand Marais, Babbitt, Ely, and Witten would hold Dorothy Moulter days. And they were different days, um, usually on a Sunday throughout the winter. And they would all do a club ride up to Dorothy's. And sometimes up to 100 snowmobiles would converge right outside of Dorothy's Islands on Knife Lake. But Dorothy knew they would let her know well in advance when they were gonna be coming. And so Dorothy would have huge cauldrons of soup ready for them, hot coffee, sawhorses with planks for tables, and they would just have a big outdoor picnic while they were up there. Do we have any questions while taking a little break? No, but I'm sure that there's going to be some. Okay. Really I'm sure they're welcome to do so. <laughs> Does somebody have a question? No, but I. One of my questions is, 
did she give like a list of those teams that when the hundred people come out, they could all bring something, right? <laughs> so they could all bring, I saw even in the picture that she had like a wooden frame for photos and things. I was like, oh, all the luxuries that you probably wouldn't be able to get in the summer months, but maybe in the winter, she could ask for some of those luxurious things. Yeah. And that, that's a good point to mention that because previously before snowmobiles, you know, you, you had, um, planes before 52, uh, dog sled teams or skiing with a polk behind you. And, and Dorothy did ski and snowshoe from the Isle of Pines out to Moose Lake, uh, fairly often. So she wasn't opposed to doing that. But when you needed to haul in heavy equipment, um, wintertime was the best time to do it. And so uh, once, for example, propane appliances became available, um, Dorothy had propane refrigerators, propane stoves, propane washing machine, you know, 100 pound propane tanks are over 100 pounds, <laughs> you know, they're, they're heavy. And so wintertime pulling them in via snowmobile was a really efficient way to do that. And so um, Dorothy might send a verbal message with somebody who had been up one, you know, one weekend and then somebody coming up the next weekend that would be relayed and they would bring up. Um, sometimes she would send written messages and people would take the note and just go directly to the grocery store and give it to them and they would get her box ready. And then whoever was heading back out into the wilderness would pick it up and take it to Dorothy. Um, so there is this huge support network that Dorothy had. Um, and the reality is she probably wouldn't have been able to be as successful, especially after the flight effect, um, without that, that big network of friends and family to help her do things. And, and that's true with a lot of folks up in this area, especially folks that live down on the end of the road or up at the end of the gun flint is you, you have to, you know, be okay with relying on your friends and neighbors to give you a hand when you need it. And, and that's what, that makes our communities. It makes us stronger. And Dorothy really, really knew that and recognized that and was part of that. It actually has somebody in, in the group that's attending tonight that said they were here from the Graham Ray club, which I didn't even know that the Graham Ray club went over there. If anybody wants to talk yeah. about it for a second, we'd be good. glad to hear about it. So there's a, a nice connection to Dorothy's history right there. Excellent. Yeah, I just didn't even know the Grammarie Club went over that way. So that's cool too. Well, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but um, Benny Ambrose lived on Otter Track, um, which is a little closer to the Gunflint side of the Boundary Waters. And so for um, quite a, a handful of folks here in Ely, at least, um, like my in-laws did this, they would plan a trip and they would go out to Dorothy's and then they'd go out and see Benny and then go across to the Gunflint and then work their way back. Um, and so I, I wonder if if the Gunflint Club or the Grand Marais Club did that as well, kind of went out, you know, made a big trip out of it. Well, it sounds like a great time once you got there. <laughs> yeah. So this, uh, this is Dorothy's other Polaris that we have in our collection. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have a, an appropriate space in our museum to display it or to store it. So it's in offsite storage right now. So um, hopefully we're just waiting for some big donor to give us um, you know, money so we can build another building and display all the other collection items that we have uh, that we can't have here on site. Next on you know, things are good for Dorothy. She, she was getting more and more popular, busier and busier. Um, but as we got closer to the late 50s, um, the federal government was really kind of ramping up their, their planning for what would eventually be the Boundary Waters. And so I mentioned before, um, in the late 40s, the Forest Service was actively going out and trying to, to purchase private land. Um, and this went on up until right before the Wilderness Act. And they were very persistent. And I want to make sure that I, I mention in this that although the Forest Service um, is often kind of um, given the role of the bad guy, um, for lack of a, of a better word in this story, um, the Forest Service really was a, a partner 
for Dorothy, especially after the Wilderness Act and after the, the 1970s. Um, it was a very challenging time. It was a really difficult time. Um, and I would imagine, you know, it, it's kind of like even in our current um, socio-political environment, you know, we have really strong feelings um, about what our belief systems are. And somebody we care about, even maybe a relative, has the complete opposite views and values that we do. You know, we still care about them, but we might be really upset with them in the moment. And so that's kind of how the relationship with Dorothy and the, the Forest Service workers here in Ely was, is that she knew them. They were part of the community, just like she was. Um, but they were, you know, gears in, in the bigger machine of the U.S. Forest Service and um, the federal government in general. And so Dorothy really didn't like the fact that they were pressuring her to sell her property. Um, she didn't feel that they were offering her enough for what the value was. Um, and other people throughout this process um, sold right away, um, felt too much pressure, um, got really frustrated and took their business and moved to Canada. Um, and some people waited too long to where they really didn't have a choice. And that's where, where Dorothy kind of ended up. So, you know, um, depending on how familiar you are with the process of the Wilderness Act, um, there were several iterations of the 64 Act before. So in the late 50s, early 60s, but the, the Act of 1964 really kind of created the, the framework and the structure um, and the enforcement for how do you create you know, establish and then maintain a wilderness area. Um, and the biggest problem that it created for Dorothy is the part where it's an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is the visitor and does not remain. Um, and what that meant in, in plain terms is that nobody could permanently live there and you cannot have a, a business operating within um, the wilderness area. And of course, Dorothy was doing both of those things. And so um, it was a very uh, uncertain time for Dorothy. She was able to um, try to negotiate with the Forest Service. And the biggest kind of um, push that she got was that one of her friends that lived here with her was also from Chicago. His name was Bob Carey. Um, he started one of the local papers, was the editor, and before he came here, he was the editor for a large newspaper in Chicago. And he was just as frustrated and, and upset with the position that Dorothy was in, in addition to just the whole process of how the Boundary Waters came to be in general. So he wrote an editorial, um, and again, in uh, classic, you know, 1960s journalism really and pulled on the heartstrings and basically painted Dorothy as this poster child for big bad government coming in and trying to steal your property. And he sent it down to his editor or his former boss um, when he was editor at the Chicago paper and they printed it. And then it got picked up on the national newswire. And once again, Dorothy went viral um, for a different reason that her um, special, you know, brand of life was being threatened by the government. And it wasn't long before tens of thousands of letters um, in support of Dorothy and criticism of the Forest Service were sent to Washington, D.C. And it became essentially a public relations problem. <laughs> and so uh, the Forest Service um, was trying to figure out what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this situation? And the employees um, at the Ely base here came up with a, a compromise that if they give Dorothy a limited lease on her property, let's say, you know, through 1975, by the time it's 1975, she's going to be in her late 60s, going on early 70s. She's probably going to be ready to move into town have running water, have electricity, um, and it'll be a non-issue. And so they did, they granted her a temporary lease 
Um, so technically she did sell her property to the Forest Service, but then was able to have a long-term or a temporary lease on that property. Now at this time, by the time they, they kind of came to this compromise, it was 1965, Dorothy and Benny Ambrose were the last holdouts for permanent res, um, non-Indigenous residency. Um, in that area. And so because Dorothy was able to negotiate these terms because of her notoriety, um, Benny was able to kind of ride along that, that wave and was able to get his temporary uh, lease as well. So as time continued to go on, Dorothy still making her root beer. However, now she can't operate her business. So she has this resort property, but she can't charge people to um, you know, come and stay with her. So rather than just continuing on and not doing any of it, she maintained the reservations to her resort that she had been keeping and continued to take a few more and instead put donation jars or old coffee cans out in those cabins. And for the root beer, she would put a donation tin. So that way she was following the law, um, but also still maintaining a modest income during that time. She was also helping others with her uh, medical skills. So throughout, um, up until the 60s, maybe early 70s at the latest, uh, when Dorothy would go home and celebrate Christmas with her family, um, she would keep up to date on nursing skills. If she needed to go take a course or she needed to do a refresher, she was able to go do that. Um, and so she was able to provide medical assistance for people in the wilderness. And by this point, um, now we didn't have as many, um, you know, motorized traffic coming in and out, but every outfitter that was sending people in by canoe especially would circle on the map. This is where Dorothy's is. If you get into a tight spot, this is where you need to go. So now she was also hailed as this nightingale of the wilderness in addition to being the root beer lady and this Isle of Pines resort operator. So the Forest Service having thought, well, perhaps she'll be ready <laughs> to retire um, as we get into the 70s, realized fairly quickly that uh, Dorothy's not slowing down. Her visitors are not slowing down. More and more people are coming to see her. We need to, to do something about it. Um, and actually, um, you know, her root beer became kind of the thing that people knew about her. In fact, even to this day at the Dorothy Moulter Museum, um, we still have visitors come in that say they didn't realize that the root beer lady was Dorothy Moulter and that that's what this museum was about until they pulled into the parking lot. So this popularity continued to increase and um, this is a copy of a bill that was proposed um, in the state of Minnesota. It did not pass, nothing um, actually happened. It was more of a um, metaphor or, a, you know, a, um, can't think of the word right now, but, you know, it was this, this representation of, we need to do this for Dorothy. So in 1972, this bill was, was presented on the floor um, as a gesture to say, we need to do something to make sure that Dorothy Moulter doesn't get kicked off of her property. And so the Forest Service, once again, um, came up with another idea. And it was that they were going to make Dorothy a volunteer in service in return for keeping records of visitors to Knife Lake um, all throughout the year assisting or providing information to visitors that might stop by, monitoring campsites at the west end of Knife Lake, which is where her islands were located. Um, and then the flip side for Dorothy would be she was granted lifetime tenancy. And so um, this took a huge weight off of Dorothy's shoulders. Um, she no longer had to worry about what was going to happen in 1975. Was she going to have to leave? What was going to happen to her property, to 
you know, everything that, that she had been working on. So she was granted this lifetime tenancy. Of course, Benny Ambrose also <laughs> was of benefit for this decision that was made. And things were, were going really well. And then there were there was more legislation that occurred in 1978 with the BWCA Act. Um, and so this is um, the act that really kind of um, towards the end of Dorothy's life uh, created a, a situation where she was a little bit more isolated. Um, so in 1978, this particular um, act, which was incredibly controversial, um, at least here in Ely, especially, um, friends were really concerned for her because it was really the end of the motors. There was going to be a complete motor ban. Um, now, Dorothy, being a volunteer in service, was allowed to use one nine-horse motor um, for her immediate family for supplies or emergency reasons. Um, but that really changed the way that people were able to go visit Dorothy. And so close friends of hers, um, it was much more challenging for them to be able to go up and visit her during the summer months because, you know, taking your speedboat or not your speedboat, your fishing boat up to Dorothy's um, might take a couple, two, three hours. Whereas now you have to paddle a canoe that's going to take a full day to get up there. Um, so her visitation shifted a little bit. People, friends and family still went to visit. Um, and a lot of the local folks um, made sure that they spent a lot of time visiting her during the winter season when they could still drive snowmobiles. However, the snowmobile ban took effect um, January 1st, 1984. So those last, um, last two years of Dorothy's life um, were a little bit more isolating. And, um, you know, people were a little bit concerned about her up there. Um, she, one of the things that she had been given when she was granted lifetime tenancy was a two-way radio from the Forest Service and it took a nine volt battery and they would check in every day. So Dorothy would radio to the Forest Service so the Forest Service would radio to Dorothy. Um, she would forget every once in a while um, you know, it wasn't uncommon or if the Forest Service tried to get in touch with Dorothy and she was out getting firewood, she might have missed their call. Um, but there was a day in December of 1986 where um, they hadn't heard from her for a day or two. And when they still couldn't get a hold of her on the third day, um, they thought they should probably go check on her and make sure um, that she was safe um, and bring an extra battery in case her battery had died on her. And a snowstorm blew up um, and it st stuck around for a few days. They were unable to get out there. It took them about a week. Um, so from December 12th to December 18th. Um, and when they were finally able to coordinate a flight out there, um, as the pilot was rounding um, up towards the Isle of Pines, um, all of them noticed that there was no smoke coming from Dorothy's cabin. and it the reality had hit them and they knew that something probably happened. And so they landed the plane um, a little ways away and um, a couple of the folks walked up to find that she had uh, passed away. Um, she had been hauling firewood into her cabin. Um, the assumption is that she had some type of cardiac event or perhaps a stroke. Um, she was 79 years old at the time and um, otherwise very healthy. And so it was, um, it was a shock to a lot of people. Um, and it, you know, Dorothy was much more than just kind of your friend and neighbor. Um, I mentioned before the community kind of was very protective of her. And so there were a lot of folks that wanted to um, pay their respects in memorialize her in some way. And so a group of her friends um, got together and suggested a memorial up at the Isle of Pines. Now, Dorothy's family, most of them were still living down in Chicago. And so she did have a formal funeral service in Chicago. Um, Dorothy is actually buried out in Arnold, Pennsylvania. 
uh, because her wish was to be laid to rest next to her mother who died when she was seven. Um, but a lot of Ely folks and folks from the Northwoods were not able to make it down to Chicago. You know, winter travel in the 80s, um, you know, people trying to take time off of work um, was very challenging. And so they decided to host an event and a group of friends that proposed this went to the Forest Service and said, look, we really want to have a, a formal memorial service out at Dorothy's Islands. Will you help us do this? And ultimately the foresters, yes. And they granted this group a one day sun up to sundown permit to take snowmobiles into the boundary waters and go up to the Isle of Pines. And so this is a view uh, from, what is say the summer island um, facing across to Robbins Island. Um, and all those snowmobiles parked um, in between. It's estimated that between 500 and 1,000 people um, came and attended that event. It was held on January 10th, 1987. And of course, um, this was a very physical activity. Uh, not everybody had a snowmobile. Um, and so in addition to this formal service, um, they also had a service at one of the local churches here in Ely and a luncheon in the basement after in good Iron Range tradition. Um, and at that luncheon is when the group of friends really started seriously talking about how can we make sure that, that this part of our local history doesn't die with Dorothy, that, that we can make sure there's something, some physical thing that that is there that people will remember the story of Dorothy. Um, and so they created a committee, which then evolved into the Dorothy Moulter Memorial Foundation. They again coordinated with the Forest Service and were granted permission to go up to um, the Isle of Pines and salvage um, everything that they could with the idea that they would have some um, memorial location where these things would be located. Um, Dorothy's family was very supportive of this. And so um, staff members from Voyager Outward Bound School and Somers Canoe Base or the Northern Tier High Adventure Base um, coordinated dog sled trips on their own time, completely volunteer on the weekends from the end of January to the beginning of March and just on weekends went up and down and up and down multiple times a day. Um, they would store the items at the canoe base, the Boy Scout base. And then in March of that year, there was a spring thaw, which of course isn't unusual for us, um, but it melted the majority of the snow on the portage trails. You can see in the picture in the upper right hand corner. Um, and these sleds were um, six dog teams, usually sometimes eight, they couldn't pull the weighted sleds. And so again, this group went to the Forest Service said, we are trying so hard. We just have a few more cabins. We have to get out of there. Will you allow us to, to use other means? And because the Forest Service was so impressed with the effort that this group had already made for the last two months, um, they allowed this group a long weekend um, to be able to go in with ATVs and trailers and haul out the logs of the cabins that they were not able to get with the dog sleds. Um, and this is, a, this is a really big deal. Um, you know, so twice now, in honor of Dorothy Moulter, they were allowed special use permits to take motorized vehicles into the Boundary Waters. And these, all of these items, um, once they made it out to Moose Lake, um, they eventually all made their way down here to Ely. The first location of the Dorothy Moulter Museum um, was at where the current Chamber of Commerce is on the corner of um, Highway 1 and 169. Um, and so the, cab the winter cabin was assembled there. Um, however, nobody used it. Nobody went into it. Um, there wasn't staffing for interpretive programs or tours. And it wasn't an ideal location to have um, the kind of information that this foundation was really interested in. And so um, through a, an effort 
of collaboration with the city of Ely and the Chamber of Commerce and local businesses and other organizations. Um, they cleared and prepared the site where we're located now, which is adjacent to the Ely Cemetery. It's in a historic red pine plantation, which is the Joseph Roseman Memorial Forest, planted in the 40s um, for World War II veterans, and established this location as the permanent um, location for the Dorothy Moulter Museum. And so now here I am talking with you about um, who Dorothy was and why you should care about her. Um, so why should you care about her? Um, aside from, you know, the obvious, it's part of our shared history, our shared, not just local history, but history in general. Um, Dorothy has a lot of qualities that we can learn from, um, you know, her integrity, her generosity, um, her perseverance, but also she can really be, um, you know, a motivational or inspirational figure for people um, that are unsure of what their path in life is or are afraid to take the path that they really want to because it doesn't fit into what's expected of them. You know, Dorothy, as a young woman in the 1920s and 30s, from her early age, really did not align or, or find a, a path to fit into the, you know, the gender roles of her time, the heteronormative roles. You know, she chose not to be married ever, not to have children ever. Um, and for, for the time period that she was young and into adulthood, that was, that was not usual. Um, but she did it with grace and she did it with joy. She loved her life up on the islands and she did it with kindness. And so personally, I like to think that she's a wonderful inspiration for folks that are living in um, situations where they might feel marginalized or marginalized or they just haven't found themselves yet either. Um, and so she, she has a lot to her story to give to a lot of different types of people. So here at the Dorothy Moulter Museum, uh, we have three of her cabins. In each cabin, we have different exhibit themes. So the cabin that's in, in the image on the left is the Katie cabin that has an exhibit about um, how the Boundary Waters was created. However, it begins um, at the last glacial period in Northeastern Minnesota. Um, and it, it's very detailed. It's intentionally lists out the various, um, you know, cultural uses of the landscape, um, legislative changes to the, to the management of the landscape, controversies that were created, um, because we want our visitors to really, really know the history without um, the bias of somebody telling a story to them. Um, so then folks can make their own choices and decisions. The cabin that's in the picture on the right is the winter cabin, and that was Dorothy's cabin. That's where she spent her winters. Um, and of course, she would set up a summer tent and stay in the summer tent during the summer. And then we have a point cabin. So that particular cabin um, has an exhibit about living in the Boundary Waters. So what was it like for Dorothy to live off the grid? And how did she adapt to the changing of the seasons? And what were the things she had to do? getting water, chopping wood. Um, so the, the realities of living in the wilderness. Um, and then of course on our property, we also have um, a nature trail. It's about a quarter mile long. Um, we have interpretive signage all along the trail that focuses on Northwoods ecology. Um, so flora and fauna, um, our responsibilities to the landscape as Northwoods stewards. Uh, we also have a community bird feeding area um, we don't have a lot of bird feed feeders out there now, um, but once um, we feel a little bit better about the whole bird flu situation, as well as the bear situation in the spring, hopefully we'll have more feeders, but surrounding that area is a pollinator garden, um, and that area is open to the public year round. Um, and then we offer different programs and tours throughout the year. So we open Memorial Day weekend. We're open daily through Labor Day weekend from 10 to five. 
with guided programs. Um, so we don't call them tours because we're not leading you through the cabins, but we're giving you an introductory program on Dorothy and then telling you what you'll find in the cabins. And then this summer, we're also going to go back to our community events. So in June, July, and August, we'll have a free community event each month um, with a different theme. And most of our marketing is on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, but we also have our website, which is www.ripyourlady.com, um, where we post all of the events and things that are going to be going on at the museum. Um, and I've got that information on this slide for you. So if you wanted to jot it down or commit it to memory for later use, it's there for you. But um, I hope that that me chatting with you about Dorothy, um, even if you knew her, or you met her, or you're familiar with her, hopefully you learned a little bit of something new um, or maybe found a new um, little bit of inspiration in her story. So I, again, I appreciate your, your participation being here and um, listening to me talk to you <laughs> about Dorothy Moulter for the last, um, I don't know, hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Jessica, for, for all you've shared so far and those links. And as I was mentioning before, I honestly, every time I've been following your, your social media on Facebook, new tidbits come up that I'm just like, oh, I had no idea. And how interesting. Um, one of the last ones you posted was about the summer tents that went up for the staff to go in. Because I was like, that must have been a lot of cabins, but actually they, the cabins were the ones that people were renting. They moved out, right? Is that, is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably a little cooler, right? With, with a nice breeze. It's good air conditioning to be in a tent. Usually. Second. Yeah. Yep. Well, everyone, I welcome, I welcome you to unmute, ask questions, uh, share your stories. I know somebody in this group said uh, they had uh, actually attended uh, up, up by, uh, going by snowmobile um, and had been to the memorial and things. So oh, just cool. a lot of people in this group that are really, I think, connected. Um, there is a question in here. Um, do you have any history of the normal Anderson tenure on Fraser Lake? He was also a life, life lease. Oh, uh, Nordahl, Nordahl Anderson. I don't. Unfortunately, my knowledge for other folks that um, had property or stayed up there or um, indigenous families that exercise the right to be there. I don't have a lot of information about that, but the Ely Winton Historical Society might have more information on specific people that lived within the Boundary Waters. That's a great question. Uh, anybody else that has any other questions they wanted to ask? If you are having a hard time unmuting yourself and you're wanting to talk, please feel free to put it in the chat and I can unmute you too. Um, there's another question in here. Did Dorothy get any kind of stipend for being a volunteer? Uh, no, not that we are aware of. Um, she actually had to, um, up until that point, she had to pay a lease fee to be able to stay there. Um, so we haven't found any kind of record of that. So interesting. I'm glad that that's why I mentioned that there was other people that were in the Boundary Waters um, beyond the time frame that maybe you expected of them. Um, yeah, and there are some, um, I don't know how many, I'm, I, it's, it's not my wheelhouse, but um, there are lease, like family lease cabins. Um, and Voyagers National Park also has some of these properties where um, part of the agreement was that the family had, you know, it was a hundred year lease. And after the hundred years, then it automatically went back to the federal government or it was a family lease. And once the last surviving child of the original owner dies, then it automatically goes back to the forest service. So um, there were some other arrangements similar to that, but as far as like permanent residents, um, non-indigenous permanent residents, Dorothy was the last one that was there exclusively as her home. So interesting. I, I've heard of families that were Fisher families on Isle Royal, but that is true too, that they have that sort of lease that mm -hmm. on a certain generation that it ends, but for the time being, they still have 
uh, maybe visitation opportunities. Yeah. Is there any other questions? You guys, we have a couple of minutes and this is a great time to pick her brain. I know that when I went up there and visited, that really every room and the ca every cabin had a piece of information I had never heard about before. I didn't know about. Um, and it's just such a beautiful space. It, it's really unique to be able to go up there and have such a living kind of monument to somebody. Yeah, you can really immerse yourself and kind of feel that, you know, what it was like to live in a situation like that. And to my understanding, you guys are still selling root beer on her behalf? We are. I was actually going to bring that up um, since we have some time. So as a, a we're a private nonprofit organization. And um, so we rely on, you know, ways that we can generate revenue, but they, they have to fulfill our mission. They have to meet um, part of our mission. And so one of our biggest products and revenue generators is the root beer. So we have a proprietary blend of root beer that is based on Dorothy's best bottle of root beer. Um, if you know anybody or you had had one of Dorothy's root beers, um, you're probably familiar with the fact that it was oftentimes um, inconsistent in flavor <laughs> and carbonation depending on when you visited. Um, so our product is brewed professionally. We contract a brewer. So we don't have brewing facilities and there isn't one nearby that also has a bottling and packaging facility. So the brewer we work with is Gray Brewing Company. They're physically located in Janesville, Wisconsin, and they are contract brewers. So not only do they produce their own beer and root beer, but they contract other businesses. Um, and so we're one of those businesses. We do between four and six brews every year. So we just had a brew occur in April and then they bottle it and they package it and then we ship it. So we sell it here at the museum. We distribute it throughout the Ely area. And we also work with um, North Shore businesses. I know Blue Water Cafe sells Dorothy's. Um, but we also work with Michaud's out of Duluth. So it's a distributor, um, d and out of Brainerd, Capital Beverage out of the Twin Cities, and then L&M Fleet Supply uh, in Grand Rapids and Mountain Iron also sell it. Well, it's good to hear that the volunteers aren't uh, having to necessarily go and, and cap some repair uh, <laughs> as a side project. Uh, somebody that attended and, and um, had been and met Dorothy said, um, there was a paddle walk that you haven't mentioned that they would love for you to talk more about that Dorothy used to yeah. make sure um, everybody saw that. So um, Dorothy was an avid gardener. She loved flower gardens and she liked um, what we would call landscaping, you know, making things look nice. And so she would create these fences using broken paddles and initially she would take the paddles and paint them bright colors like blue and red and yellow and green. Um, and eventually people saw that it was broken paddles that made up this fence. And so they would start putting their paddles on and then they would be painting their paddles. And eventually it became this badge of honor that if you had a broken paddle, you painted, you know, maybe it was your Boy Scout troop or Girl Scout troop or your um, camp that you were staying at or the city or town you were from or your family name um, and people got really into this and there are some with elaborate paintings on them they're beautiful and so she would hang them on these paddle fences so they were around her gardens they were on walkways they were along the footbridges between the islands um, and it got to the point where people were intentionally breaking paddles so that they could put them on the fence. And Dorothy had to institute a rule that, nope, you had to break it in a natural way. It had to be broken by paddling or dropping it or some, you know, not intentional way before you could put your paddle on her fence. And so now at the museum, um, part of our membership um, program is that we offer Paddler members. And in recognition of your membership, we put a painted paddle out on our paddle fence. 
So we have a membership paddle fence at the museum, but the original painted paddles from Dorothy's Islands are actually on display in the rafters of the point cabin because we don't want them outside. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to be hard to make sure that you can maintain everything and yeah. <laughs> uh, preserve as well as, as show. Um, and I, I mean, I know when I was there, they were talking about this, these extra facilities or spaces in the future will make a big difference mm -hmm. for being able to do that, to be able to show uh, more of her items, but also protect them. Yeah. So one of the questions I had is what I'm assuming because she was a nurse and, and, and kind of in the middle of nowhere, that there was many people that had situations happen that were sort of emergencies that that came to her. Um, any stories that were sort of well-documented or interesting that would be a highlight? You know, there are hundreds of stories of people coming to her with fish hooks in their hands. Um, those were kind of the more common ones or a hatchet injury on a leg or a foot. Um, those are kind of the standard <laughs> issues she dealt with. Um, but she also had people where um, campsites were struck by lightning. Um, I think in the last few weeks, I posted a picture of a couple on our Facebook or our socials where um, their tent had been struck by lightning and uh, the, the, it was a husband and wife, the wife's shoes, the soles of her shoes had melted. Um, and so they paddled over to Dorothy's and Dorothy let them stay in a cabin. Um, and that happened on more than one occasion. Um, there are situations where people would have a broken leg or a broken arm um, and, you know, she would get them to a, a situation where they could either safely paddle themselves out or stay with her until somebody paddled out and got help. Um, hypothermia in the wintertime, um, always making sure that there was a hot pot of coffee on, um, that the fire was going so that if people that were snowmobiling got stuck in slush and had to walk to get to her, that she could get them warmed back up. Um, the stories are endless, <laughs> but she also helped take care of wildlife too, and dogs, um, Nebs, which was, um, Bill Berglund's dog, um, hated airplanes. And one of the airplanes that was coming in to land at the dock, Nebs got really angry at it and he ran and he tried to bite the prop and it knocked him off the dock and it broke his jaw. And Bill Berglund was going to dispatch him because like, well, he can't, he can't do anything. He can't eat, can't open his mouth. And Dorothy um, reset his jaw and wired it shut and spoon fed, spoon fed him gruel until the jaw set and he was able to, to <laughs> eat on his own again. So incredible. Somebody asked in here, did she hunt during the season just play meat for herself? Um, she did. It wasn't... Um, I would not call her a subsistence hunter. She did not hunt um, for survival. You know, that's, she hunted when she could. Um, so grouse, upland game in the fall. Um, I don't have any photographic or evidence otherwise that she was a deer hunter, um, but we do have a story of wolves had killed a deer right off of her island. And she, you know, she saw it happen. And so she went out there uh, with her gun and a flashlight and the wolves scattered, um, which is pretty normal. They, they're afraid of us. Um, and she took the back straps from the deer um, that the wolves killed. Um, and she did have to dispatch a bear or two. Um, it wasn't super common uh, being on an island helped, but in really lean years, um, and she had problem bears that would come in and break into cabins to get at food supply. Um, I do know she had to dispatch a couple bears at some point in her life. And you were mentioning that um, in the later years that she was allowed to use a snowmobile, but did she have access to a motorized boat in the summer months? Um, yes. Yep. So she had uh, a motor she could use. Um, I think it was a nine, nine horse. Um, that she or a member of her family could use either to go out and get supplies or for emergencies. And she was able to use that forever, like throughout her whole life. Um, but the snowmobile, she wasn't able to use after January 1st, 1984. 
Yeah, I was just thinking of those emergency situations that, uh, you know, for herself, but also for those that maybe were coming to the island and needing help. And, yeah, and that's where that radio came in handy. Um, after 72, when she had that radio with her, um, she was able to communicate much easier with town. So if there was an emergency, she could call on them. Yeah, that had to have been, I mean, strange give and take, right? Like more communication, but less access in yeah. some ways, right? Her yeah. own independent access, at least. Well, everyone, um, we're getting close to the end of the hour. If you have anything that you wanted to ask, this is the time. Uh, clearly, Jessica has a deep knowledge, and we are just so grateful for her time to talk tonight. And, uh, you know, when you put together the next specialized uh, presentation, you'll have to let us know so we can let people I know about it as well if it's on Zoom, or maybe we'll just have to invite you back again and have a specialized presentation on, on other topics. The there you go. Happy to. Oh, we have another question. Did Dorothy have any serious medical issues herself? So I, I actually had a conversation um, similar to this day, and I don't have any record that she had any serious um, medical complications. Um, you know, she went into town regularly for the dentist for checkups, um, other than, you know, the occasional cold or flu, we don't have any record that she had a serious ailment of any kind, which is one of the reasons people were really surprised that she passed. Yeah, that sounds very hard to be so surprised about it. Um, and one of my other things is, did she go on vacation? I mean, we know that she went and saw family in Chicago and things, but you know, that's a, that's a hard life. She's living, um, dealing with a lot of challenges. Was yeah. there a vacation from her vacation spot? <laughs> she did. Um, I don't have, you know, really good details. I do know that she, um, with her father, she would occasionally go visit family in Michigan. Uh, there were cousins up in that area. And usually it was going down to Chicago over the holidays. Christmas was her favorite time of the year. Um, we don't know what, um, if she had any kind of religious affiliation other than kind of the general Christian, um, but she did celebrate Christmas and it was her favorite season. And so she would be gone between two weeks and a month over the holiday season. I kind of can't imagine going from the middle of the woods into <laughs> downtown Chicago. Uh, just such an interesting yeah especially thing. if you think if she was gone and didn't come back until the end of January and it was you know 20 below the even today the cabins hold that cold and so this morning I went out to the cabins and they were still the temperature inside was about 11 degrees even though the outside temperature was over 30 degrees <laughs> So when you think about going to bed in the wintertime and your bed's kind of cold and chilly and you might have an electric blanket, just think of Dorothy coming back for a month and her bed literally being frozen. <laughs> Definitely one of those situations where you put like the bricks in the, the heater and then you put them in, wrapped in blankets in your bed sort of thing. I yep. don't know. Can you imagine thawing out? Hopefully she had some good friends that would maybe come help out uh, yeah start a fire up. the day before <laughs> yeah it's like your friends that you asked to go over turn on the heat a little bit she had to go yeah <laughs> no place well jessica <laughs> it was so wonderful learning for me today and everyone else thank you for coming and spending what is actually a lovely sunny night here in Cook county um which also sounds like that same is true in ely uh with us it's just a pleasure to have you all here and if you want to have one last question or two you're welcome to stay on um, but i want to give everybody else the chance to go on with their evenings maybe they haven't had dinner yet so Thanks, everybody. I can see the thank yous from, from quite a few people. So I appreciate your time and your attention. Have a wonderful evening. What I love is when it, things end, often people sit around um, wanting to hear just in case somebody asks the next great question. But it's so fun to have somebody in this audience that has actually had familiarity with, the, with being up there. And um, yeah. it just seems like a magical time to, to really have experienced things. Yeah, I agree. I wish I would have gotten to meet her. I never got to meet her personally. Um, my in-laws did. And um, from what I know, my dad and my uncle did, but I never did. <laughs> well, I know that in the future, we'd love to probably hear about your your uh, last trip that you just made out in the, win in the winter to go explore. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It was, it was phenomenal. And I'll be taking a group up 
uh, with a with a co-partner in June on a canoe trip. Oh wow! So there's a dog sled trip in the winter and a canoe trip in the summer. There is, is. the the canoe trip is women's only, um, and it's geared towards getting um, people that had never canoed or never been that far into the boundary waters out mm -hmm. uh, fully guided um, fully outfitted program and then the winter trip is um, focused on trout fishing and it's winter camping so it's a shorter trip it's two nights and three days but this was the first time we had done it and so we're going to be meeting to discuss what we're going to change or how we're going to do it differently for next year so well, I can't imagine the fun of getting, um, going fishing, seeing all the beautiful things outside, but also maybe the stories around the campfire yeah. uh, that include Dorothy and uh, just people's experiences out in the boundary waters and, and in nature. Yep. Mm -hmm. History is always a great around the fire. I know. Well, and somebody else asked a, a trip there would also like to see some of the pictures. So, uh, I don't know if you saw that comment in the chat. But. I did. So we do, um, I believe our Facebook page is public, so you don't have to have an account to go look at it. Um, but we do have, um, not. A, I do have an album from the dog sled trip and also a short video um, that is linked. I'll have to double check. It's on my personal page, but I made it public. Um, and then there's always an album for every summer trip. And it's always in June. So the album is from last June from our Boundary Waters trip, um, canoe trip. So if you wanted to see any pictures um, from those, they're there on our social page. And Jessica, do they go out to the, in the same spot or are they, it's kind of, is it affiliated with, with Dorothy Walters Island or is it not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the canoe trip, um, we go out to Knife Lake and we spend two nights on Knife. And um, during the full day that we're there, we make a trip over to Dorothy's Islands. And um, depending on what people's interests are, um, they can independently explore the islands, um, but we usually will hang out um, where Dorothy's winter cabin was in that bay. And then we'll go over to where the Ribbon Rock is, um, which is a banded jasper formation. It's a big boulder. It looks like ribbons. It's really pretty. Um, and then we'll get out and we'll walk around and, and my co-leader, Doris Kologi, um, was a Girl Scout camp guide. Um, so the Girl Scout camp that was up on Moose Lake, she was one of the first staff members. And so every summer she led trips and she would go to Dorothy's. So she knew Dorothy. And so she does a little tour and talks about, you know, how she would bring the girls up there and, you know, where you would talk with Dorothy and where the root beer was. And yeah, so it's, um, we do spend a good amount of time on the islands actually exploring, but then we also, you know, we canoe down to Thunder Point, which is a huge, big rock outcropping that's like a height of land um, and hike up to the top and, and get a view um, there. If people want to go fishing, fishing is something we can do. Um, but a I mean, lot of it. Question. Does anybody <laughs> catch a fish as big as Dorothy did? That's the question. No, no, not yet. Um, the first year we did this trip, um, my predecessor was the co-leader and she caught a lake trout while they were out there, but it was nowhere near as big as Dorothy's. <laughs> when, it, when it's basically the size of a size of a little kid, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I know we'll definitely have to talk about it another time, but I just, it fascinated, it, I'm sure they did a lot to clean up the space, but it, I, there's gotta be some remnants, right? Like a little something that's found every so often when people go out. It used to be um, right away afterwards for, I wanna say like eight or 10 years, um, people that really looked could find bottle caps. Um, and then I found out last summer, I think, um, that there was like this little secret thing where people would actually leave bottle caps. So now I'm wondering, well, <laughs> Were the people finding Dorothy's or were they finding other people's bottle caps and had no idea? Um, but they're in the, in the bay on the east side of the big island where Dorothy's winter cabin was by. Um, it's more shallow. It's like, you know, it drops off fairly quickly. And then you can, it's so clear, you can see down like 12 to 15 feet. Um, and I've seen like a jug at the bottom, um, a gear 
some kind of gear from like a pulley, um, other random pieces of equipment, you know, that were still on the bottom. You can see the silhouette from the silt. Um, her gardens, some of the, the planted or cultivated flowers she planted, um, sometimes will still bloom like tiger lilies. Uh, she had lilac bushes and they've kind of taken over part of the summer island. And so you can, if you go at the right time, you can, um, they're blooming and it's just this wave of lilacs. It's really pretty. My gosh, that sounds magical. Yeah. A unique experience. Yeah. Well, as we all keep learning, Jessica, I could just keep, keep listening to you. So uh, we are going to say thank you again and just wish everybody a great night and enjoy the last bit of sunshine before the end of the night. Thank you so much for inviting me again. I really appreciate it, Kelsey. My pleasure. Always great to partner. All right. Take care and hopefully you'll see us soon. Absolutely. Come on, come up there and check it out in person again. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye.